Hello, welcome. My name is Darren Morata and I am a board member at the OACC. I am also a huge comic book fan and collector, and I particularly love historical comics uh, and graphic novels. And I was captivated by We Hear By Reviews, and it has a direct connection to me and my family, as my family, my, both my parents were actually interned in Tajmi in Canada during the wartime. And so it was fascinating to compare to my family's experience and learn uh, some new things as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panel today. First up, I have Frank Abe, who is the lead author of We Hereby Refuse, Japanese Resistance to Wartime Incarceration. He won an American Book Award for John Okada, the life and rediscovered work of the author of No No Boy, and wrote and directed the PBS film on the largest organized resistance to incarceration, Conscious and the Constitution. With Floyd Chung, he's currently co-editing a new anthology for Penguin Classics on the literature of Japanese American incarceration. And he also blogs at resistors.com. It's also my pleasure to introduce our other panelists, all of which who have a direct relationship to important characters in the book. Kathleen Purcell is here, the daughter of uh, Mitsui Endo's attorney, James Purcell. Wayne Collins Jr. is here, the son of Hiroshi Kashiwagi's attorney, Wayne Collins. And Sadako Nimura Kashiwagi is also here and is the wife of Hiroshi Kashiwagi. Welcome to all, and thank you for joining us today. And I will now pass it to Frank to introduce the work. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Darren, uh, for that kind introduction. And I want to thank uh, East Wind Books of Berkeley and Oakland Asian Cultural Center for providing this platform for um, new Asian American works. So I want to take 10 minutes just to set up the story in the graphic novel as it relates to our special guests today to provide a foundation for the conversation to come. Um, our story is told by three characters in their early 20s. Uh, each is confronted with a decision demanded of them by their own government. Uh, Jim Okutsu of Seattle receives a draft notice while in an American concentration camp, this one at Minidoka, Idaho. He refuses to comply until he gets his day in court to contest the fact of his incarceration. Hiroshi Kashiwagi and his family are removed from their farm outside Sacramento and sent to Chuli Lake <clears throat> when it was just another war relocation center. While there, everyone in camp is given a loyalty questionnaire and compelled to sign it. Hiroshi refuses. And Mitsuya Endo of Sacramento has a job as a clerk for the state of California Department of Employment. This was the kind of job that offered civil service protections and it was something that she very much prized. So Endo was upset when after Pearl Harbor, the California State Personnel Board suspended all the Nisei working for the state and started proceedings to terminate them just for being Japanese. Uh, Mitzi was one of 63 employees who organized to contest their termination. JACL President Saab Kido had done business with an attorney in San Francisco that he trusted, a guy named James Purcell. And Purcell met with the group in Sacramento and agreed to represent them. Uh, in the meantime, though, the army began to issue city by city exclusion orders under the powers granted to it by the president and his executive order 9066, signed 80 years ago this, this week. Now, I, I love this drawing of the Mills Tower on Montgomery Street, San Francisco, which still stands there today uh, because uh, this is where the office uh, was held of uh, William Ferreter and James Purcell. Now, James Purcell, uh, as a man of the law and an officer of the court, was offended by the racial exclusion orders and denial of due process. And this point was driven home to him when he went to visit a client at the Tan Fran Assembly Center and saw him living in a horse stall. So Purcell began to discuss with his law partner the idea of filing some kind of a lawsuit. But to do that, he needed legal standing. He needed to find what he called the perfect plaintiff. So he sends a questionnaire to his clients in the civil service case to find someone who doesn't speak Japanese, doesn't attend uh, Japanese language school, and who is not Buddhist or Shinto. These are all characteristics that inflamed public opinion at the time, and, and it distracted from the central issue of the rights of the Nisei under the Constitution. And also by this time, all his employment clients are being held in the Sacramento Assembly Center. Uh, Purcell explains the nature of habeas corpus to Mitsuya Endo, uh, which uh, habeas corpus being Latin for produce the body. Uh, and I should explain that he, 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 he lands on Endo after he 
find some other people as well. And Endo is reluctant. I mean, she's um, reluctant to step forward um, and uh, eventually says yes to lending her name as the named plaintiff in the case that becomes called uh, Ex Parte Endo. So Endo is sent to Tule Lake and Purcell communicates with her by correspondence. He files the habeas corpus case in U.S. District Court in San Francisco. And the judge there, there surprises him by taking the case seriously and asking to hear arguments. After the lunch hour, Army Brass rushed down to the courthouse to back up the U.S. attorney. For a moment, things look hopeful, but the judge takes a year before dismissing the case without explanation. By this time, Endo has been moved to the Topaz camp in Utah, and Purcell appeals to the U.S. Court of Appeals. Now, the WRA is worried enough about the merits of this case, the strength of her case, that it sends its chief solicitor to negotiate a settlement with Nitzia Endo. Philip Glick offers her a deal. He says, we'll let you leave Topaz and go anywhere outside the West Coast exclusion zone. And Purcell advises her that this is the government's way of making the case go away, because if she's no longer held in camp, the case gets dismissed, right? So here is where Mitsuya Endo shows her character. Instead of choosing her own personal freedom, she decides to stay in camp for two more years in order for her case to reach the U.S. Supreme Court. And this is the position she took in a letter to James Purcell. I am willing to go as far as I can on this case. And that path leads to the U.S. Supreme Court, where Purcell argues that while Congress authorized the mass removal of Japanese Americans, it did not authorize the continued detention of admittedly loyal U.S. citizens. And the high court agrees, a decision which forces the War Relocation Authority to shut down the camps and free the people. Purcell sends a telegram to Endo at Topaz, and she's so happy she and a friend join hands and do a little dance in her barrack. So that's the essence of how James Purcell help bring about the end of forced inc detention for all Japanese Americans before the end of war in Japan. And uh, as I was preparing for this event today, it, it really hit me that the camps were not closed just because the war ended. It took the courage of a guy, of a guy like James Purcell of San Francisco to force an end to mass incarceration. All right, let me move quickly to the story of another man, Wayne Collins. Again, here is Hiroshi Kashiwagi. He was at Tule Lake when the Army and WRA issue a joint demand for all incarcerees to fill out a questionnaire to screen them for their loyalty. And at the end uh, of, the, of the questionnaire, there's, they have to sign an oath of loyalty to the U.S. Now, Hiroshi was fed up with the government continually demanding that he prove his loyalty. And he refuses the pressure to sign loyalty oath, especially when no one even the camp administration, no one knew the consequences of a yes or no answer. Well, the consequence uh, that was unknown at the time uh, was soon revealed uh, when the WRA would take all those forms, all those papers, and use them to sort 120,000 questionnaires into two piles, yes and no. And the WRA converts Tule Lake into its segregation center to, to hold those in the no pile, right? So the WRA adds more watchtowers, a double man-proof fence, and builds a military stockade to hold inmate leaders. This is a prison inside of a prison. Wayne Collins comes into the picture when the Northern California ACLU recruits him to help shut down the Tule Lake stockade. Collins was already working on Fred Korematsu's petition to the Supreme Court. He was he also had an office, I, I recently learned, in the Mills Tower in San Francisco um, with, with James Purcell. Author Mitchie Weglin uh, famously describes Collins as uh, a fiery Irishman. By her account, Collins demands a meeting with WRA officials and threatened a full-scale expose of legal and physical atrocities committed in wanton violation of constitutional rights and a habeas corpus lawsuit. Uh, Project Director uh, Raymond Best himself uh, agrees to free all the stockade inmates and, and Collins even watched as Raymond Best phoned his deputies at TV Lake to release all the inmates and demolish the stockade. Now, all during this time, members of Congress have been trying for years to strip the Nisei of their US citizenship. 
In July of 44, they do succeed in getting the Denaturalization Act passed. And this is important because it enables the Nisei to voluntarily renounce their U.S. citizenship, and many families walk into the trap, including that of Hiroshi Kashiwagi, who immediately regrets his decision and desperately tries to withdraw it. Wayne Collins returns to Tule Lake to shut down a second jail that was built by, by the camp director. And Hiroshi is among a small group that asks Mr. Collins for help in canceling their renunciation paperwork. Now, by this time, more than 5,000 Nisei had signed renunciation papers. Uh, that's about seven of every 10 adult Nisei in Tule Lake had signed papers to renounce his citizenship. Hiroshi's memory of Wayne Collins was that he was a sharply dressed man who was a chain smoker. And we're not encouraging tobacco use in the graphic novel, but we did include that detail to kind of characterize him. Um, his point to Hiroshi and the others was that you can no, no more resign citizenship in time of war than you can resign from the human race, as he says there. And he points out to them that they renounced under, under the duress of two years of essentially false imprisonment and physical coercion from gangs in camp that the government knowingly allowed to run wild with only rumor and misinformation to guide them. So Collins scrawls a sample letter to the attorney general to start the process for people to start withdrawing their renunciations. And Hiroshi was part of the Tule Lake Defense Committee that held a mass meeting of a thousand people where it was agreed to hire Wayne Collins to represent them in a class action lawsuit. Finally, just before an army transport was set to set was was uh, to set sail for Japan from from Fort Mason in San Francisco, uh, with the first groups of repatriates and expatriates from Tule Lake, a federal judge in San Francisco grants Collins a writ of habeas corpus, and in a dramatic confrontation, Collins stops the ship from sailing and demands to remove all those who had joined the class action lawsuit. And for 10 years after the war, Wayne Collins single-handedly fought the Justice Department to restore citizenship to Hiroshi and the 5,000 others who had renounced. And Hiroshi was always grateful uh, to Wayne Collins, and Hiroshi, in fact, dedicated his memoirs to, to Wayne. So that is a quick survey of the story in our graphic novel, just to provide a foundation for a conversation. And to show how the work of James Purcell and Wayne Collins, two attorneys from the Mills Tower on Montgomery Street, San Francisco, stood up for Japanese Americans and the Constitution and changed the course of US history. I'm glad that through this graphic novel, we could bring their stories to a wider audience. Thank you, thank you. Back to you, Darren. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that summation and that great walkthrough. And also the extra details are always so magical to hear from your lips. So fantastic color on that. So I just want to go to my initial reaction to the book because it, it was a, was a very incredibly powerful and eye-opening book for me for a number of reasons. Uh, there were moments I found so incredibly horrifying and the rampant psychological and physical abuse through the camps, which I'm somewhat familiar with, but the no-win situation they were put in where they'd be forced to renounce their own citizenship was staggering to me. I did not realize the extent of that. And uh, it was incredibly enlightening to me and moving to me to learn about the multiple and diverse uh, resistance that efforts that went on in the camps uh, from multiple angles and multiple people on that side. So to me, that was a bit of hope after the bit of the hope experience. And again, the direct reaction of horror to mm -hmm. the, uh, the initial uh, storyline of it. And I just want to know, did you have uh, an expectation that this story would have that effect on your readers. Uh, I'm certainly glad that it landed with the audience. I'm certainly glad it, you know, it makes sense because it's a very, as, as you can tell from my, my conversation, it's a very complex story. And it's a story that the Japanese American community has not really understood even after 80 years, Darren. I mean, this is still a story that is m mired in misinformation, myth, and, and disinformation, quite frankly. Uh, the, the idea that these were so-called no-no boys or disloyal. My, in, in, in kind of, and at, I had promised Barbara Takei of the Tula Lake Committee that, that after doing the, the film on the, Fair, the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee, uh, that uh, we would... I would, I would try and do something, the same recovery and reframing of the story camp resistance for those in Tule Lake. And boy, what a, what I mean, what a 
a difficult story that turned out to be uh, because my, 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 my conclusion after working on, on this Tule Lick story is that it's the government that created a class of disloyals, not the Japanese Americans at Tule Lake, uh, who simply answered a questionnaire that was confusing, um, that had no no real clear understanding of the consequences of the answers. Yeah, and and for, and, for, and and some who answered no simply out of protest and anger over their their eviction incarceration. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I mean the idea that these were disloyals. No, no, they weren't. It, and the book makes the point. It was the government that was disloyal to them, disloyal to the Constitution, disloyal to the principles uh, of this nation. Uh, and and it was hard for people like Hiroshi Kashiwagi to hold fast to that principle of loyalty to the country over loyalty to uh, a government of men. They were, they were, they were loyal, they were loyal to, a gov uh, to a nation of laws, not a government of men. So um, I, I, I'm, I, know, I, I was worried that the, the book might not succeed on that point, but I'm glad it landed with you and, and many others. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, no, very direct for sure. And uh, so I just wanted to open it up a bit to the panel at this point. So I'd like to talk to uh, maybe a Sadako first as a direct relationship to the story. Um, what was your perspective on the story? What was your first takeaway from it? Oh my, it was very difficult to read. Um, um, first of all, I before I go any further, I want to thank uh, ACC and East Wind and the Native peoples and um, Mr. Mr. Stahl and Mr. Collins, and I like at this point, uh, like a huge, huge thank you to both of them. Um, we of the Nikkei community really owe you. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank <clears throat> my niece, uh, Tamiko, for doing such a good job. And she knows I had difficulty reading it on several levels. Um, for one thing, the font was a little bit hard for me. And with my eyes and all that and so anyway um oh and then uh, thank you june for helping me get on <laughs> i'm not very uh, computer savvy <laughs> but anyway um uh, as i said it was very difficult for me to read um because it brought back many memories and i was only eight at the time but it's amazing how much i do remember and um <clears throat> I, I read the book and I'm going, you know, I'm living this, but am I really living it? Because at that time, as I say, I was only about oh, eight to 12 at the time, and I was not aware of the true significance of what was going on, you know, unlike the youth of today who are really sophisticated, you know? And <clears throat> so, and as, as I say, it was very, very difficult for me to read on that basis. And then uh, having uh, those I know struggle with what happened to them and how the community, our community, you know, ostracized us. And I'd like to, at this point, uh, want to explain why I want, uh, my name is Sadako Nimura Kashiwaki, in, in, uh, because my father was a uh, very um, vocal Issei. And when they came to to um, recruit for the army, he went to to a, uh, a meet, the meeting and told them they were fools if they if they volunteered. And as a result, he was uh, taken from Tule Lake and incarcerated at at uh, Santa Fe. So you know, Nimura, he, he, as it turns out, he was one of the first to be uh, taken away for having, you know, um, brought this thing about the, the questionnaire up. And um, so anyway, that's why I wanted my new when I included. Um, uh, I know at some point, uh, um, people ask me, you know, when did you know that uh, uh, Hiroshi had contacted Mr. Collins and um, well, as I read in the book, uh, Rebel, 
uh, lawyer about Mr. Collins said that Hiroshi met him in uh, 1945. Well, in 1945, I was only 10 years old and I would not have known Hiroshi. So that's a bad question. <laughs> and, <laughs> see, there was a 10 and a half years difference in our ages. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's an honor to have you here and to have a first-hand rec uh, recollection of the events, uh, such as it may be when you were so young, but still fantastic. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And maybe I'll just uh, move on to Wayne, uh, Wayne Collins Jr. Maybe have your first reaction to the work and let us know what you thought. Well, if I were to confess this, my first experience reading a graphic novel, <clears throat> I'd never read a, a graphic comic book before. So it was most <laughs> illuminating. So very difficult to bring home to an audience. I think the actuality uh, of the experience that people had, Tully Lake in particular, um, I don't think even people who worked on the JERS project, uh, Rosalie Hankey being one of the anthropologists for UC that wrote the study, uh, I think it's called The Spoilage of the Institute Tully Lake, even comprehended uh, what was going on because she uh, submitted an affidavit in support of the government's position in opposition to the renunciants. I guess I'll get to that point later. The issue in the cases that involve renunciation, which is called Abo versus Clark, and would have various names over time, depending upon who was in or out of the class action, uh, was duress. And whether a renunciation of your citizenship, forget whether it was in time of war or not, at any time, was made freely and voluntarily. And Rosalie Hankey, I believe in her affidavit in that court proceeding, said that people were renouncing regardless of the Hoshidan terrorism. That's right. Because they were incarcerated in a concentration camp behind barbed wire. The conduct of the Hoshidan, you know, the, the terrorist group, if they wish to call it that, but oppression breeds all kinds of resistance of different categories and kinds and formulas, uh, including the Hoshi Don, who would shave their heads, you know, bow to the emperor, you know, pray to the rising sun, demonstrate in the mornings, and terrify and beat people up. And they probably kill somebody until they're like, it's irrelevant. When an American citizen is arrested, he or she is taken within 24 hours before a magistrate, and they're informed of their charges against them. They're informed of their right to counsel. They're informed of their right to cross-examination, to subpoena evidence, to compel a trial, to compel the government to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And each and every one of those rights, and in fact virtually every right guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, was already attacked and stripped of these people by the conduct of the American government in opening the assembly centers, later relocation centers, later uh, virtually concentration camps. To begin with, the terrorism of the Hoshi Don uh, was a bad thing. We don't applaud it, but regardless of that, even people who were not phased by the Hoshi Don renounced. It took a while, but if you were any, read Minoru Kyoto, a book beyond loyalty. He didn't renounce when he got beaten up by the Hoshidan. He didn't get renounced when he was first in turn. He got renounced when he was fed up with it, after years of it. And so the issue became this. The lawsuit that was filed, Abo versus Clark, in San Francisco, came on for a hearing what was called a motion for summary judgment based upon 
affidavits. And the trial court at that time was Lewis Goodman, who was one of the better judges on that court. And after months and months and months of continuances, in which the Department of Justice promised that they would produce actual evidence that they had against certain members of the group of people they had at Tule Lake who renounced, uh, they came back with their designation, all 5,000. And so, at my father's request, Goodman struck the government's answer and took their default set aside their initiations, and granted the habeas corpus writ. Well, the government appealed. And that appeal went up to the Ninth Circuit. And a companion case called Murakami was heard by that circuit with unfortunate results. It was listed by the Southern California ACLU, which is a wholly different story, a different can of worms. But the plaintiffs in that case were a minor, a person with mental illness, and I forget the third one, who by law and evidence were incompetent to renounce their nationality. So the Ninth Circuit took the back door and they accepted Murakami vacated that renunciation, but sent back the Abba versus Clark case for hearings. Did the government have evidence or could the Rumskins show they were loyal? Now that would have taken probably in individual trials about 15 years. Even if it were a one day trial only to tie up the courtrooms. And so the Department of Justice then entered into a stipulation that there was a presumption of uh, renunciation being invalid, mm -hmm. but the renunciants had to verify it by affidavit. And that took more than 10 years because at some point they were, they were released into my father's theoretical custody. Right. And they scattered around yeah. the... Uh, to different places. Primary knew their lives the West Coast, the East Coast, to Seabrook Farms in New Jersey. I remember the first time we ever took a vacation. My father said, get in the car, we're going on vacation. And we drove to, well, by way of Grand Canyon, Zion, Bryce, and Glacier to uh, Seabrook Farms. Wow. Uh, because somebody hadn't answered a letter, which meant you could write off your gas consumption on your taxes if you... <laughs> <laughs> probably what he did to look for someone who hadn't yeah. responded to correspondence with Seabrook Farms. Just keeping track of the number mm -hmm. of uh, renunciants was a chore at that time. We didn't yeah. have the modern computer method. You know, they of kept course. track of it by a little like a shoebox. If every renunciant had a card, every card was coded, especially because the facts before different kinds of renunciants were different for each. Mm -hmm. Who was a strandee? Yeah. Who was an Issei? Who was a Kibe? Who was a Nisei? Who was a renunciant? Uh, who, who, who on what loyalty oath had done what? Yeah. And each one got different correspondence from their attorney. Um, I can just interrupt uh, Mr. Collins for a second. I think we need to bring in Kathleen for just a quick second. That's okay. We'll get back to the story, though. I think uh, you're going somewhere really interesting there. <laughs> there. <laughs> so, Kathleen, I'd like to love to hear your perspective on on your take on the first read of the book. What you thought? What was your reaction? Yeah. Well, I had many reactions, but I'd say my my foremost reaction was one of gratitude. Um, gratitude that the story, the stories, are being told, and in an accessible way, um, because and told in all their dimensions, um, the horror and the injustice, the injustices, which I think we have to remember. We have to remember that this can happen and that it's happened more than once and that prejudices can lead to injustices very easily. Um, 
the story of the pitfalls and the dangers of communities being divided and turned against one another uh, in these times of crisis. Um, and also the stories of courage and resistance and persistence. You know, all of these efforts took years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also that notion of people feeling a responsibility for one another's well being. You know, Ms. Tuyendo um, has always been held up in our family as a hero um, because. For, for saying yes in the first place and for continuing to keep this case alive at her own personal uh, cost. Um, but also, you know, in other ways as well, I, I was going through my dad's papers after he died and there were all these files on renunciates and deportees. So Wayne Collins drew him into it. Um, and as I was telling you, um, when the case in Mitsui Endo's case first went to the Supreme Court, my father, who was a pretty young lawyer, was not yet a member of the court. So Wayne Collins stepped up uh, so that that case could go forward and signed the initial brief. Um, years later, when they were challenging the alien land laws, an African-American lawyer, Lauren Mas Miller, who was an expert on, on restrictive covenants, filed in a meet, a friend of the court brief. And a white realtor said, okay, I'll have my property tied up for years so we can bring this challenge. So all of those phenomena, um, and you know, I am, I am very aware that after um, September 11th, 2001, because I'm part Arab, <laughs> um, it was the Japanese American community as a community that stood up and said, we lived this, don't do it again. Yeah. Um, Less history repeat itself, right? Here we exactly. are. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's why I say my, my foremost reaction is, is gratitude. That Catherine, thank you so to. much for all the help you gave me in the stories you shared about your father going to district court and going to Supreme Court. Um, what, what, kind of, what kind of guy was your father um, as a child growing up? What, what kind of guy was he to you? Well, you know, it's interesting to hear you describe Wayne Collins as a fiery Irishman because my father was, was very Irish, but, but he wasn't fiery. No. Okay. <laughs> he could get fiery, but on the natural, he, he was a, a quieter type. Um, but uh, he was outraged by this mm -hmm. and uh, and that outrage showed through and um, we as children experienced him as the devil's advocate in every conversation um, <laughs> and so to go back and read you know his opening brief in the district court where he's just you quoted some of it Frank in the book you know he always called these concentration camps. He did not call them internment camps. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, a big, that's a big distinction, honestly. So I'd like to stay with that yeah. just for a, a quick second, because I think it's it's fascinating to me that both Wayne Collins and, and your father were so incensed by this, that they, they demanded action. They brought uh, the full weight of the law and sided with the, the Japanese Americans squarely with this case. So is that a direct result of just who they were or did they see that injustice as just being such an affront that they had to pursue it at that point? Was it just in them from the beginning or was it always uh, was something they just took up in arms as it happened? Well, my, my dad was very cognizant of history. He was an historian as well as a lawyer. And he... Uh, he knew from his, not his direct experience, but his knowledge of family experience, that when the Irish came to the United States, um, they experienced uh, similar injustices. And I would say as a lawyer and as an individual, he had a, a strong and abiding commitment to equal rights. So, you know, when, when he knew a Chinese grocer who couldn't buy a house, he bought the house and then resold it. Um, so it operated personally and it also operated in his practice. He 
represented the unions and the working people. Um, he did a lot of criminal defense. Uh, and and he, I didn't learn until I went to Asia that he had studied Asian history in college. Oh. So he felt a particular connection, I think, to the immigrant and the Asian immigrant community. Good, very good. Wayne, can you tell us a little bit more about your dad and how he came, came to the, be such a proponent for this? Well, I was general counsel for the ACLU, for one thing. But it had been for years. I was one of the founders of Northern California ACLU, which couldn't practice law itself as a corporation at that time. That was legal fiction. And uh, so he'd already written briefs in support of the ACLU, friend of the court, for Endo, Yasui, and Hirabayashi. And uh, had already written briefs in the Cameron versus, versus King case where they tried to strike uh, Japanese Americans from the voting rolls. That was a nut right winger in San Francisco. So there's a lot of stuff going on at the time in San Francisco, which was a very progressive city. Mm -hmm. It's a port town. It's a coastal city. And generally more progressive than interior cities because they have more progress with the world. Um, he was not a Stanford graduate. He went to night law school. He worked in the railway yards at night uh, carrying ice up to the freight cars and dropping him down the chute. And he would sleep that off and go to law school in the evening. Uh, he was expelled from high school and many other schools too. Which is meant that, you know, he's raised basically by a single mother. His father died when he was seven. Uh, and he, he lucked out. But uh, civil liberties was his passion. For and, 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 I mean, it was absolute and concrete. Your, your dedication to that, to the First Amendment, Bill of Rights was absolute and complete. And it, it was personal. And he was also very close to Senri Nall, who was an art dealer in Chinatown, and an immigrant from Japan, uh, who was his first client as well as lifelong friend. And uh, the father of Chio Wada, his secretary, married to Yori Wada, the regent. Uh, so with the Asian community from the 20s on, uh, he'd been involved as an attorney, uh, as a confidant, and as a friend. Thank you. Frank, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about, can you just talk a bit about the challenges you ran into when creating the work? Mitsuya Endo was a cipher. Uh, Mitsuya Endo did not give interviews. Uh, Mitsuya Endo um, was only a name on a legal brief for many years. Uh, and so developing her, I, I knew Jimokutsu and I knew Hiroshi both very well. And they're both very public figures, given lots of interviews. Hiroshi's written a lot of you know, books, memoirs, plays. So you know, we had their, their language. We, had the, we, knew the, we knew who they were how they talked, you know. Endo um, was not, um, not, not only did she not give interviews, I mean, she really ret retreated from, from any kind of public life uh, because she was a private person and was not a, not a you know, just, again, a, a reluctant recruit. So um, we were fortunate that Tamiko Nomura, in doing the research for the book, found the letters that uh, James Purcell had exchanged with Mitsuya Endo. So we had not only you know, his, his words and his syntax, but also Endo's as well. Uh, that one line, I'm willing to go as far as I can in this case. So you know, it's a direct quote, yeah, I mean, that, that tells you so much about her character from just one sentence. And it's you know, kind of teasing that out and, and extrapolating that into a character on the page. Um, this, this is, again, the first story that tells the, the personal story of Mitsuya Endo as a person, you know, who she was, uh, the kind of personality she had. Uh, we, we, and, and one reason we don't know much about her is that in the 1980s, uh, Korematsu, Hirabashi, Yasui, their cases were all reopened under the writ of Cor era Coram Nobis. And um, they, you know, publicity, photos, press conferences, and, and their children uh, have, you know, foundations, the Korematsu Foundation, you know, films, you know, Mahali, yes, we did a film about her father. The, the um, Endo children uh, 
also very private, you know, did not champion her story. So uh, it was a case of um, really digging hard. Talk, I'm, I'm so glad, Kathleen. I'm so glad I found you and you talked to me about your father. I'm so glad your father donated his letters to the California State Archives. And, um, and you kept your records too. And also um, I flew to Chicago to meet with uh, Mitsu Endo's son, Wayne Tsutsumi. Mm. Uh, and he gave me just, you know, a bit, a bit about what kind of mother she was. Uh, and the key detail was, I had a feeling that Mitsu Endo had a nickname because, you know, Sadako will appreciate this. You know, all, all, a lot of Nisa give each other nicknames like, you know, horse or paunch or, you know, um, <laughs> Mits, you know, and, and I figured she had to have a nickname, Mitsuya, Mitsuya. And I asked Wayne, did you, what have, what'd your friends call her? Uh, and he says, oh yeah, they, everyone called her Mitzi, Mitzi, uh, after the actress Mitzi Gaynor, 1940s. Uh, yeah. And so that was just a little, you know, just bits and pieces you put them together to get, uh, we didn't want to put our own words into these mouths, you know, into, into their, into Mitzi Endo's mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to you know, make stuff up. So, I mean, everything was fairly rigorous in terms of sticking to their actual act scenes, incidents, um, and, and, and words, syntax. Uh, and, and, you know, we won't know, I mean, Endo's children have said that it, it does, you know, resemble her. Uh, it, it wasn't untrue to who Mitsuya Endo was. And I hope, Kathleen, that our characterization of James Purcell was not untrue to the father that you knew. I'd love to hear a bit about the other panel's reactions to seeing some of their relatives in the work. Did it meet your expectation or were there some things that are missing you felt that could be added or did you feel it was pretty accurate? Right, me, Kathleen, first. Well, <laughs> I had mixed reactions because on the one hand, I could recognize my dad in the pictures. On the other hand, it's the nature of graphic novels that, that it's not the same. Um, but, um, but I think that the essence of his integrity um, and his courage and his practicality, um, because he was a very practical person, you know, if the Supreme Court judges had a question, he figured he was going to make more mileage answering the question than ignoring it. And he and the ACLU, good as friends as he and Wayne Collins were, fought over whether to raise the alternative argument and let the court avoid the constitutional argument. Um, what is the so, alternative argument, Kathleen? Well, all of the other cases went up under the Constitution, that it was unconstitutional to discriminate on the basis of race. Right. Endo went up on two arguments, one the constitutional one, but the other that the executive had overreached um, what statutory power they had when they continued to detain people. And the Supreme Court said, we don't have to reach the constitutional question. So Korematsu established the constitutional standard, which is an appalling one. Um, Endo said the executive overreached, let these people go. I see. Right. And, and that they, they exceeded the authority granted by Congress. Exactly. Uh, only for, for removal, but not for continued detention. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. That's, good. That's a great point, Kathleen. Um, good. And Sadako, may I have to ask you, how did you feel about uh, Hiroshi being pictured in the book? How did that feel and how did that look to you? Well, I think that Tamiko did a very good job. Um, we had a, uh, she had a real close relationship with him too. So, uh, yeah. And uh, I just kind of like to add a, a few more things. Um, um, I'd like to thank, uh, congratulate the Dan Ferran committee because they got their project underway. And so, uh, Doug, I saw you on, on the video. And uh, <laughs> um, another thing is, um, this has not come up, but I'm going to purposely bring it up. Um, 
there has been this movement to ban books. And that dismays me on various levels because I can remember as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, seeing my father who really, really respected and loved books, pitch his book into the fire. And I'm thinking, why is he doing that? You remember I was only nine at the time and I didn't realize, but yeah, um, that's one, one, and that, that happened in many families, not just ours. And, and also uh, family pictures were destroyed that way. And another thing I'd like to point out is that when you ban a book, it doesn't work, folks. It just, it's counterproductive. That's true. And as uh, Mr. Collins pointed out, San Francisco is progressive and the library is very progressive. And usually what happened is that we'd make, a, a, um, we'd make lists of the banned books or we'd separate the books out and, and have a separate, you know, uh, section so I mean, I'm, I'm saying this as a as a librarian and, you know I've been there seeing it yeah and then lastly oh and then when I heard about the the banning of the books I'm going oh is this going to happen to I hereby refuse I mean it was a very chilling moment for me as well we hope. I, actually, I hope so, Sadako. I, mean, I invite that. I, I dare the Tennessee school board to ban <laughs> uh, "Read by Refuse" because then we won't be able to print the books fast enough to get them banned. <laughs> um, okay. Well, anyway, Tennessee banning mouse. We, our, our book is also inspired by mouse. Art Spiegelman's mouse uh, yes. in this in its, its, its approach and tenor. So that it would be well. Uh, yeah. As I say, people want to read it more when the when book is banned. Exactly. Yeah. If you go to Cape and Cal Comics right now, they have stocked up on mouse by like tenfold now, and it's mm -hmm. selling very fast. So. Right. And then lastly, it's a violation of our civil rights. I mean, we're being told what we can read and what we can't read. You know. Yeah. Uh, no. Reprehensible. Yeah. Uh, Sadako, I have a question, uh, Darren, for Sadako. After the war, you know, Hiroshi lived for ten years as a Native American alien. He was not a U.S. citizen, and he wasn't a, a, a citizen of no nation. Did he talk about that much with you? Uh, I working with Wayne Collins, trying to get his citizenship back. Did it did it bother him that he had he's basically a stateless person? He didn't talk about it too much, but he did make a point whenever someone asked him to to speak to talk about the camp. He felt that he was honor bound to talk about it because people say, oh, you know, it, it, it's over. Forget it. You know, but he he said, no, we need to talk about it. So it won't happen again. And. Yeah, he, he as I say, he, he was very and, and I'd say to him, you know, because he, he he'd accept this invitation to speak and then he'd complain about it. So I'd say. Why do you accept it? You know, because it, it really it he didn't it, it wasn't his favorite subject actually, and so he says because I need to tell the truth. Yeah, no, he was amazing. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I met him in nineteen early nineteen seventies uh, at a a forum for the Center for Japanese American Studies at Pine Methodist Church uh, in the Outer Richmond, and uh, he was one of the first. Who was speaking out about being a renunciant and a no-no on the questionnaire, and that I really always, you know, be, admired him then, befriended him, and kept in touch over the years. So he he really was one of the first, and he was one of the first writers too. Don't forget, exactly, and one of the first UC, actors, first actors uh, at UC Berkeley and uh, UCLA, I think. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I just want to ask uh, one more question while we're on that topic of um, a bit of what's happening now and also in the last couple of years about what do you, what do you think that happens to uh, really drive social actions and anti-racism protests of today? Do you feel like the, it stems a lot from the work that your relatives have done in this case? And where do you hope that it will go? Is that for Sadako? Let's start with you, Frank, maybe. What's the question again? 
So how do you feel that this book will impact is, or is impacting directly to uh, anti-racism protests today? Well, I mean, the, 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 the book makes a connection that the, the exclusion of Japanese Americans in World War II was based solely on race and that race is an issue that continues to divide us today. Uh, and so um, we end with, uh, by the way, Sadako, you, you saw you have a little cameo at the end of the book, you and Hiroshi, a little drawing of you and Hiroshi at the Chile Lake pilgrimage, the last one in 1999. I mean, I mean, 2019. Uh, behind the banner of Never Again Is Now. Uh, so the, the book you know, draws the connection between um, the FBI knocking on the door of our grandparents uh, to arrest them, to ICE knocking on the doors, breaking down the doors of immigrants uh, in America today. Uh, draws a connection to uh, the detention uh, of asylum seekers at the southern border and the family separations that mirror the family separations uh, after Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, race continues to be an issue uh, where uh, the, the, the needs of those targeted on the basis of their race, religion, or immigration status is something that uh, we must continue to keep uh, uh, fighting. I, I must include those who, who, you know, who are different because they're transgender or whatever their sexual orientation is. Uh, I, I, we need to include everybody, you yes. know? This is the fight for everybody. So I just want to also ask the panel, what, what is your hope for what this book can help achieve in the future? Hey, Kathleen, we can start with you on that one. Well, you know, in the last interview that he gave when my dad was in his 80s, he was asked what lessons he thought we should take from this. And his answer was that how the government treats people starts with how the people treat each other. Um, and so I think part of what I hope from the book is that it will raise our our thinking and our feeling about how people treat each other uh, in in the smallest of things and in the largest of things in the one-on-one -on -one and in the policy and and power of of our government wayne do you have any opinion about where you hope this work will go and take us well, I think it was a very important book. Uh, first of all, because it's prone to have larger dissemination than a just hardcover book with only print in it. Uh, among given the, the short time span of Americans' attentiveness today, uh, if it were not for the redress movement and the Vietnam War movement and those oppositions, the arena for discourse wouldn't have expanded to discuss these things in America. So you, you can never forget and never forgive. You have to keep always before you the need to defend every human being's civil and human rights. And uh, that's the primary dedication that all of us owe each other. Regrettably, even Indeed. today in this country. Indeed. Frank and Sadako, any comment on where you think this work, you hope this book will achieve in the future? I just hope it's, I hope it's read. We have some questions from the audience, Jerry, if you wanted to move into those. In, oh. in the chat. Do you see those? I do indeed. I do indeed. Let's have okay. a little look at what's going on there. Okay. Ah, there's actually a direct question for Wayne Collins here. A uh, reader asked, uh, did Wayne Collins have any resistance from the national ACLU who did not take this strong stand supporting the Japanese American community? Well, the whole fiasco resulted in the formation of two ACLUs, with Northern California being independent completely of the National ACLU for 30 years. The National ACLU sought to sabotage these cases, sought to sabotage everything, because they were intimately connected to, committed to the Democratic Party and the Roosevelt administration. You, you could, they had force lines 
with the Department of Justice. They had feelers, connections to them. They, uh, you got you to read this stuff to believe it. Uh, what they were actually doing. And Roger Baldwin, chief of the ACLU, tried to interfere with all the renunciation cases, tried to fear the, fear the Japanese American cases, uh, and called Northern California, threatened them, and they would not stand down. Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, it, it's unfortunate that politics makes you believe that to whisper in the ears of power, you have to give up your independence and your integrity of thought. But so often in politics, you do that. In the ACLU's case, it was uh, insidious. Um, yeah, Wayne's absolutely right. I mean, in, in the book, I made a very strong point to show Ernest Bessig was representing the Northern California ACLU in, in going to the stockade and giving affidavits from the men in the stockade. Uh, uh, in the Heart Mountain draft resistance cases, it was Roger Baldwin who wrote a public letter denouncing the, the draft resistors um, and their case. And it was, you know, others from uh, uh, Northern California, Samuel Menon, attorney in Denver, who took on their cases. Uh, so I, I really wanted to, to give a shout out to Northern California ACLU. I didn't realize they had, they had existed separately for 30 years, but that's, that's really something. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, um, the Wada family. They devoted a lot of time and energy in the effort to to get the renunciants their their um, citizenship back. And there, I'm, I'm sure there are many others that I don't know of. And in our tradition, we have a, a, a saying: "Okage sama," people who we know and don't know are working on our behalf. And to all those, I say thank you. Very good, very good. Uh, there's one more question in the chat. It says, uh, where can the info be found on Dorothy Swain Thomas's affidavit? Some academia are very critical of the role she played in studying the community as a living laboratory, but she was one of the leading women sociologists of the day who had compelled the Japanese American grad students who had been incarcerated to participate in the studies. Go ahead, Wayne. No, someone else go first. And I'll, I'll carve. Well, you, you mentioned, uh, I, 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 I'm not aware of the affidavit specifically from Rosalie uh, Hanky Wax, but the, the, the work of, of Dorothy Swain Thomas and the anthropologists uh, in the JURS project, Japanese Evacuation and Resettlement Study, is problematic, uh, agreed. I, I look at it as simply raw material. The interviews and the voices in the, the spoilage uh, were critical for us in getting the story of the Tule Lake Revolt, the beatings in the, uh, in the stockade um, accurate. Uh, and, and so there are, there are just stories that the, the value in their work to me is the primary uh, interviews that they conducted as field workers in Tule Lake. It's re remarkable that they were there because Without that information, we wouldn't know some of the, the texture, the, the, the tenor of the conflicts inside camp. Um, having said that, you know, there's evidence that they conducted rumor experiments in, in Tule Lake, where they would start a rumor in one end of the camp and then see how it, trans it, it you know, traveled like a game of telephone across Tule Lake and, and how distorted it was at the other end. And, and people got a lot of misinformation as a result of that. Uh, so that, that is certainly something that needs to be, still hasn't been, hasn't been studied very carefully still. Um, but, and, and Rosalie Hanky Wax also, I think, admitted in her book, Doing Fieldwork. I mean, she admits that she betrayed Joe Kurihara uh, in some way that um, by providing information, providing information to the camp administration that got Joe in trouble. And she admits that, and she, you know, she admits that she kind of crossed the line in some in some places, in crossing the line from being an observer to a participant. Uh, and so, yeah. So, so Rosalie, Rosalie Hanky Wax 
was denounced by Violet de Cristoforo, the poet, uh, for ruining her life as well uh, and uh, disrupting the relationship between her and her children. Um, and Violet wrote a long affidavit about that and to her, to her dying day was angry with Rosalie Hanky Wax. I called Rosalie Hanky Wax about this 30 years ago and Rosalie just denied it and said, it's, it's in the past, I don't wanna talk about it and, and ended the conversation. What's your thought, Wayne? Well, I'm thinking back at my father's notes in the, uh, on the fly leaf to the spoilage that these people had absolutely no comprehension whatsoever of the real issue in Tule Lake, period. What it meant just to be behind the bars, period. Uh, the minutiae, the ins and outs of it were irrelevant to the fact of its unconstitutionality and illegality. Uh, and and you, you lose yourself in those personal histories and, and on, on, on the molecules of facts thrown against the wall. You overlook the forest that says you can't do this. Sure. Uh, I mean, they, they were anthropologists and social scientists. They weren't advocates, you know, like, like your father was, uh, was as a lawyer. And, and the value in the spoilage to me, and, and Barbara Tiki will disagree with me on this, uh, the, is that, um, I mean, she, she does take the side of the, uh, her interviewees, her subjects, her, her, uh, her, her informants, uh, very seriously. And, and she, she, she frames it as a battle between the, the Tule Lake camp leadership, the Daiho Shakai, the representative committee, against you know, the WRA and Raymond Best and Vern Austin and the others who are part of the WRA machinery. And you read the spoilage and it does give you a very strong sense of the, the indignity that they, they were subjected to and, and a strong sense of how the Tule Lake incarcerees fought back, uh, pushed back against the administrative machinery of the war relocation and the government. Uh, it's, it's real strong. And so I, I found value in that, even though there are still problematic elements to the Jura study. Well, the JERS project is the best source of material on internment, I'm sure, to date. Yes, agreed. Seven, seven books uh, that UC Berkeley put out at that time. Yeah, they're all, they're all behind me on the bookshelf over here. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so I just want to point out that we had a, a nice comment on the chat as well, too, from uh, Emily Morase, whose uh, father was Kenji Morase, incarcerated at Poston, and always spoke highly of Wayne Collins and James Purcell, delighted to see their children. We owe them a deep debt of thanks to these allies. Uh, and great to see Sadako always speaking out, such an important voice in our community. So that would be a nice comment to hear from the group chat. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you. Frank, I just have one quick question, though, which I, I forgot to ask, which is about the art style in the book, where you purposely have two different artists doing segments of the book, depending on what the, the character or study is. And I just want to understand what made you come to that decision and then also how everybody else felt about that as well. The Wingluck Museum got a grant from the National Park Service for a series of three graphic novels, Ours is the Second, and the, the committee wanted to hire two authors, or two writers, and two artists without thinking through how are you going to get four people who don't know each other real well to work together to create a coherent book <laughs> right. uh, and how, and how is the artwork going to look side by side? It, it would have been simpler if we'd done three chapters with you know, different art, artwork for each chapter, but I really wanted to tell a continuous chronology. So the reader gets an, uh, a sense of the epic arc of the narrative of incarceration from start to finish. Uh, and tell the story chronologically. When you do that, you gotta you gotta mix the the two art styles together, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and we're told we, we, this is the, the the thing we sweated the most, Darren is is this gonna work? You know, with two different art styles. Indeed, uh, I didn't think it would, but uh, <laughs> it somehow uh, by by carefully uh, writing the story differently from the point of view of the, the Akutsu Endo characters and, and, and doing more of a narrative voice for the Hiroshi Kashiwagi character uh, for the style of drawings and the black and white drawings, it does have a consistent tone across all three stories where um, 
but, but there was a, there was a there was a, a craft behind that in terms of uh, getting the words right so that you don't you don't you don't lose continuity when you change art styles. Uh, so that, that that took a couple of years to work out. Uh, but uh, that that was a choice of the citizens committee, and um, just just glad that the story hangs together as a whole. Uh, it worked out very nicely, I, I would say, from my perspective, anyway. Mm -hmm. I think it brings us an extra level of distinction and uh, passion to that to the work in some ways as well, too. When it changes, changes well, you you like way. comics, Jerry. I mean, I, I, Paul Constant in, in the Seattle area critic said that he'd never seen a graphic novel or a comic with you know two different artists doing different parts of the story. Of, of one story and having it work. So, you know, it, it was, it's certainly unique. Okay, good. Uh, we had one more question in the chat too from uh, H.C. H. Dong. She wanted to know, or he wanted to know, can someone speak about the connection to the Chinese immigration deportation cases during the Cold War? Um, I'll speak to that. If, if you look at the Endo case, or you look at even the Renunciates cases, um, they are anchored in citizenship. Um, and the, the deportation and our treatment, not just deportation, but mistreatment of immigrants, uh, then during the Cold War and now, um, raise the problem in our system that permits uh, a differential treatment of people who are perceived as outsiders. And socially, of course, we have broad and problematic uh, notions of outsiders. But legally, we have designated immigrants as outsiders and have um, justified and permitted uh, abuses and mistreatments uh, that we forbid, at least in theory, when it comes to citizens. And that is a dichotomy and a contradiction, and I would offer a hypocrisy in our system that still needs to be Incredible. grappled with. Yes. Citizenship, yes, and, and also during race. Uh, I think that in terms of Chinese Americans, uh, we're, we're seeing a resurgence of uh, Chinese nationals being suspected of stealing ideas and technology uh, in, in uh, high tech. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at this Texas GOP candidate, Shelley Luther, uh, who was tweeting that you know, we should not allow Chinese nationals into our colleges where they can obtain classified information, steal technology, and potentially, essentially learn how to defeat the United States. It's, and, and it's simply the, the, the fear and ignorance of the other. And, uh, of the other, whether it's Chinese nationals in academia or science or, or Japanese Americans, uh, as the other uh, in World War II. Mm -hmm. Hugely problematic. Typical, it's uh, difficult to walk away when you uh, wear your otherness on your face, right? Yes. It's always a bit of a problem. It's simply fear, fear and ignorance is the common, mm -hmm. another common denominator. So I think we are getting close to time now. So I think I'm supposed to pass it back to Kemi for some closing statements. 